I'm so thankful to have been invited to this convention. Um, if you've been following me on social media, you know I've had an interesting couple of days. I'll talk about that in a second. But we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of where I've been and where I'm at right now as a creator and sort of my process, my journey, my life story, so to speak. Um, so I started, um, I really started having a blogging type conversation with myself when I started a journal when I was like nine years old. I was um, very, very Christian. I'm an atheist now. But um, <laughs> I've always been very good at talking, so I used to be really good at um, doing prayers. Um, at, we had this system at my church where you would get these little Monopoly money um, things that you can go and purchase things with um, at, at like a church store. And um, <laughs> I think they had like lamb chop on them. I'm like vaguely remembering this. Um, and I bought like this cute little like purple um, journal that had like aliens on it. It was like a knockoff Lisa Frank, and I loved that. I was super into it. Um, and that's when I started really writing my thoughts down, my, my um, feelings down, and sort of starting to have a dialogue with myself. And I've always loved journaling because you can write something down on Monday, and by Friday, you've got a full story, right? Um, and so when the internet came around, um, I decided that I wanted to start a blog, like a lot of teenagers back then. Um, and the first place I started was on this little website called Zanga. Does anyone remember Zanga? Yeah? This is the only place I've ever said that where people have been like unanimously like, yeah. Because usually people don't remember Zanga at all. And you know what? That's probably for the best. Um, <laughs> but Zanga was really when I started to kind of openly talk about my life. I used to call it my public diary. Um, I just love, you know, I just love the juxtaposition of public and diary because it's supposed to be like private. It's like very subversive. Um, <laughs> um, and so when I started blogging, um, I also started writing a lot about, you know, wanting to go to art school. Um, some of you guys may know if you do follow me, I don't expect you to, but if you do, um, I'm an illustrator and I went to school for animation and I went to my dream school, CalArts. Um, and CalArts for me was a big, a big dream of mine. Um, I went to like one convention um, and, uh, for like kids of color when I was in the fifth grade and I was a massive weeaboo back in the day. Um, I used to run around and like scream high-pitched Japanese like, oh my gosh, I would roast myself um, if I talked to teenage me. Um, but um, I was like convinced that I was going to like, like become a mangaka and like fly to Japan and just like live there, you know? And so um, I knew that I needed to go to like animation school and CalArts was like, the best school at the time. It was a school that was started by Disney. Tim Burton went there, so you know it's great. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, um, that was my dream. And so a lot of my early blogging was about me going to CalArts and that's kind of when I started to get somewhat of a following, right? Um, while I was writing about my um, experiences trying to go to school as an artist, I also started to have more conversations about gender and sexuality and things that were sort of things I was going over as a teenager at the time. Um, and I started to write about, you know, queerness and gender. And I started to get a little bit of a following of just these random people from across the world who wanted to, you know, also share in the conversation about, you know, discovering and figuring out your gender and sexuality, whatever, when you're a teenager, right? Um, so I, from the fifth grade forward, was like, I'm going to CalArts. It's the only school I wanted to go to. I asked, I called them up one day and I was like, do you guys even care about SATs? And they're like, nah. And I was like, okay, I'm not taking my SATs. Um, <laughs> and I went to like a very SAT-centric high school. Um, so <laughs> I was just like, I want to buck the system. You know, I had a mohawk. It was a, it was a whole thing. Um, and so anyway, so of course, naturally, I applied and got in. You know, my first try, looking back, I, that was bold. It was a 9% acceptance rate. I had no backup plan, <laughs> no backup plan at all. Um, and I got into CalArts, and the moment I got there, I realized that I had no responsibility to be the person who I said I was the day before. Um, and that's when I started to really understand that I was a trans woman. Um, and that's when I started to blog a lot about being trans because I was in this weird situation of like, 
my dream school that I worked in since I was in the once, you know, worked towards since I was in the fifth grade to discovering this really massive life-changing thing the moment I wasn't around all of my friends and family. Um, and so school was kind of rough for me, even though it was art school. You know, art school, to be honest, is a lot of rich kids who tend to be conservative and want mommy and daddy to pay for their, you know, their photography lessons or whatever. Um, no disrespect. Um, you know, just just saying. You know, there's a lot of um, gallery shows that were just guys taking pictures of their junk. Um, you know, um, <laughs> so not to say that can't be artistic. I'm a fan of like a nice, like, you know, photo that is artistically and tastefully done. But that was a lot of Cal Arts for me. Um, not taking pictures, just, yeah, the, yeah, anyway, moving on. Um, <laughs> and so I'd always had a YouTube channel up to this point. I started my YouTube channel when I was um, 15. Um, and I started my YouTube channel similarly to my um, diary. It was, um, I started in 2005 um, because a lot of people were encouraging me to, you know, make videos online. Um, I was like, why? I like the whole anonymous, you know, blogger thing. Um, I didn't really want to be on camera. Um, but, you know, um, my parents used to give me $25 every week to pay, buy food. And sometimes I would spend that money on Sims expansion packs um, because I also <laughs> love The Sims. Um, <laughs> um, but instead, one week I decided to get, get myself a little web camera and I started my little YouTube channel. Now, my early YouTube channel was interesting, to say the least. Um, it was a combination of my, like, hey, let me just talk about my life, what's, what's going on today, you know, um, this, this person that I, you know, don't like at school, this person who I think is really, really cool, this guy I think is cute, the person who gave me too much homework, da da da, -da. you know, the normal stuff. Um, and then I had this character called Daphne the Destroyer, um, who was, like, this emo girl who, like, really liked local music and, like, had delusions of grandeur and believed that she was going to take over the world. Um, but she was a teenager in her room. Um, and truly, Daphne was just me in my grandmother's wig with, um, <laughs> pushed the other way, <laughs> um, with black grease paint um, on my lips. Um, and that was my character. And you can still find, if you're thrifty enough, you can still find the video about Daphne the Destroyer castrating her boyfriend on Halloween. Um, and she pulls up a bag of a hot dog as like evidence of the deed, you know? So I was a feminist from, very, from day one. Um, <laughs> And so um, I was still doing YouTube up through um, the time I got into college, but obviously now I'm in a very different situation. Um, you know, um, I didn't realize when I was in high school, I was wondering like why in high school I was so popular. I mean, there are obvious reasons, but I didn't know like why I was so popular in high school. And I didn't find out until like literally the time I graduated that literally everyone watched my YouTube channel because I was like really trying hard not to share it with people, obviously, because I was talking shit, you know? Um, and I was like, oh, that's why that girl doesn't like me, because she saw the 20-minute video I made about her. Um, so, <laughs> so I went away to college, and that was a whole shock for me, too, um, because I grew up very straight edge, very Christian, like I said, and everyone was smoking weed and drinking alcohol and being artistic with their dick photos on, you know? And I just was scandalized and made a lot of videos about that. And in a similar way, it backfired on me. Um, but for me, sharing my life has always been a very important and cathartic part of my online presence. Um, maybe I just needed a therapist. Maybe, who knows? But I just became so used to doing that, so used to coming and sharing my life, everything, um, too much, to be honest. I wish I listened to my parents about everything you post online lasts forever because I can track myself from 15 years old on the internet and that's cringy as hell. Um, but, um, you know, I've always just really loved doing that. And to me, that's, I know how I've been able to form a following. There have been people who have been there with me from day one, you know, when I was struggling on my parents' couch to see me now traveling the country giving talks. Um, and I've always loved, like I said, with, you, with a journal, you can write something down on Monday, by Friday there's a story. And just by sharing my life, I've been able to have a story. And one of the unintended, um, one of the unintended effects of me doing this was I was representing this 
image of what the future for black trans kids, queer kids, et cetera, could possibly be. You know, um, I think a lot of people who are different have the unique experience of closing their eyes and trying to visualize a future for themselves and not seeing anything, right? And I know that was so true for me growing up, that when I thought of who I could be, I couldn't think of it, you know? I would not have imagined me being where I am today as a child. I would never have imagined it. You know, I thought I would honestly not be here, honestly. But now, despite how uncomfortable sometimes being online and being known can, it has, you know, has been, I'm very happy to have been able to be a representative for one type of trans person, one type of black experience, one type of queer experience um, online for all the people out there who have never really been able to see what that could possibly be, right? Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because when you blog about your life and you're trying to do it casually, you know, everyone tries to stay out of politics. I'm sure a lot of us in this room know how that goes, you know. I can't, you know, I put on my Tinder profile, like, if you, if you voted for Trump, don't swipe right. Um, it's <laughs> because I just can't separate, you know, my life from politics. And so even when I'm blogging and, and, and talking about my life in a very raw way, um, I found it very hard for me to not talk about politics, you know, because, listen, I'm black, I'm trans, I'm a woman. Like, there's a lot of conversations there. There's a ton of conversations there. Um, and it's, it became very hard for me to not on YouTube you know, express a lot of my passion for um, all the things that I believe in. Um, and so, like a lot of people um, who have a lot of opinions and, you know, think people care, I got into a lot of Facebook arguments with people, um, and they would last for days, and I would, you know, do all the, I would give all the good information, I would, you know, I would do every little argument move. I used to, like I said, I was, I'm an atheist, and so I'm very used to people getting into debates because they think, you know, they're good at it. I wasn't quite good at it, but I discovered that I was really good at explaining things through a lot of these arguments. Um, and after I went through college, um, I had the opportunity of working for Fox for a little bit. Um, in that moment, I realized I hated it. Um, it was just too fake. I'm not fake. Like, I can't pretend I like you. That's why I work for myself. You know, I can't, like... I'm the worst, like I'm the sort of person where like, if I don't like you, you're gonna know, I can't hide it, you know? And if I'm trying to hide it, I'm just real like, yeah, you know, like I'm trying real hard not to show it, but it's gonna show. Um, and that was the case with that job. And I remember when I eventually got let go, it was like, the, it, was, it was honestly the most upsetting moment in my life. I tried to act like it didn't bother me. Like I try to act like, you know, whatever. I can do bad all by myself. Like I remember I was listening to Justice um, if you, and I was walking down the street, I, it was in Hollywood Boulevard, I was like, just, just walk in to the subway, who cares? I, I didn't even like that job anyway. Um, and then I got to the train and I just remember sitting there and feeling like the universe like fall on me. And I just started crying because I had worked so hard to get into the animation industry and I hated it, you know? I absolutely hated it. Um, and having to sort of accept that maybe what you want to do is not what you were meant to do. It's a very hard pill to swallow, especially, you know, when you have sacrificed so much of your time, you know, put so much energy, so much heart into it to find out that's not the case. It's, it's, it's devastating. Um, and so, you know, but even after that, you know, bitch had a backup plan or whatever. And so, you know, I started doing children's illustration, which was fun. I did an atheist children's book, you know. I'm not going to say the story is good, but the art's awesome, you know. So, you know, art, the story's a little obnoxious, got to say. But the art is great. If I announce it, buy it, you know. Um, <laughs> but then that, you know, like freelance kind of is, it dries up. And as you, like I said before, don't really like working for people. Working as a freelancer is honestly one of the most like soul crushing things. You have people that are like, oh, so it's, it's that much? Um, okay, um, well, I guess I'll pay you your $16 an hour. Um, I could get this done on Fiverr for a lot cheaper, but I guess it's worth it with your degree in everything. Um, 
So I hated doing that also, but I still loved art. And so I kind of was left in this moment where I was like, what am I going to do? You know, I have this degree. I like to get into Facebook arguments. I have this YouTube channel. Let's just combine all three, you know, like let's just put them all together. And so that's when I started really putting a lot of energy into my YouTube channel. Um, and honestly, had it not been for Patreon, I probably would have never been able to do full time because I don't know how many of y'all do YouTube or have AdSense on your things out here, but I mean, I've never made a living off of AdSense. Um, if you have, good for you, I'm happy for you. <laughs> never been more thrilled in my life to hear that. Um, but that's never been the case for me. And so when I had Patreon, like my whole thing was like, well, let me get my rent, you know, let me make sure I get my rent. And my, I was living in like this crack house in Long Beach and it was like $400 for, you know, a month. Um, I know that out here that's cringy because I heard y'all pay $36,000 for one, a one-bedroom apartment. Um, wow, <laughs> glad I live in LA, which is still more expensive yet somehow cheaper than out here. Um, but yeah, I got my rent and that was my strategy. And then I was like, you know, let's just keep working at this and see what happens. I, I had this weirdness where at one point in my life I had this plan I was like, I'm working in the animation industry. I'm going to sit behind the stage. I'm not, no one's going to see me. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to be the next Hayao Miyazaki or whatever, you know. Um, and then that didn't work out. Turns out I'm not Hayao Miyazaki. Um, and so, you know, now I was like, let's do this thing. Um, and so when I, when I started doing that, I kind of came at it very much from a, you know, like, let the universe show you where you're supposed to fall, because I was so used to having a plan, and I learned sometimes that when, at least for me, I'm, plans are good in most situations, but at least for me, like, whenever I have a plan, um, it always falls apart. <laughs> I mean, if I have outlines and bullet points, that works, but whenever I try to meticulously plan out everything, it just falls apart, because the real world doesn't work like, you know, the bullet point, the, the like, whole spreadsheet you've put down on paper, usually. Um, at least for me. Um, and so then I started getting contacted to do speaking things. I remember the first one I did was, Google, was with Google. Um, and Google um, flew me out to Charleston, South Carolina, I believe. Um, and that was like a couple of weeks after the shooting that had happened. And so it was really tense. Um, it was interesting. I'm from Southern California. And so I'm used to being able to have a free range of walking anywhere. And in Charleston, I was talking to a bunch of, a group of black people, and they were like, look, if you get to a point where the, where the pavement, um, you know, where there's no pavement anymore, like, turn around, because you're, like, literally walking into, like, racist territory. And traveling has really allowed me to sort of see more of the reality of what racism in this country looks like. Um, and so a lot of my life has sort of now been informed and changed, a lot of my perspectives have now been informed and changed by me being able to just travel and talk to new and different types of people. I'm a huge fan of talking to people who um, are different than I am. Um, I'm often different than every person I walk into a space. I have yet to be at a Google event where there's another black trans girl. I'm the token, you know? I'll, I'll accept it, you know, I'll take it. But, you know, I'd like to get to the point where I was not the only person, where they're tired. Of, there's so many options that they're like, cat, stay home, you know? Um, we don't need you. We keep inviting you. We don't care anymore. It's too cliche. There's too many black trans people on the, unit, on the internet. Um, and so I started doing speaking, and that kind of picked up. And right now, I make most of my income from doing talks. Um, right now, when it comes to my work, I'm sort of focused a lot on learning, sharing, and growing, because that's kind of a thing I've done with my followers. My followers are always dragging me, always clapping back at me and telling me how wrong I was. And I appreciate that because I clap back too. And it's good to have, you know, a relationship with someone where you can clap back and you can have a conversation, you can hug it out after. Um, so, so much of my platform is based on my community. It's based on what the needs of my community are. Um, I love to sort of see something that I feel could make a good video, a good like educational video in conversations I have and be like, I'm gonna make a whole video about that. Like I just made a video about um, consent because apparently some people still don't understand that. Um, <laughs> and that was um, something that kind of came off of conversations I was having with my followers about a consent contract. I'm sure you, I mean, you guys are, this is, this is like, this still, I don't know if it's Silicon Valley, but there's a lot of tech 
people here, I'm assuming, and I'm sure you guys have heard of Legal Fling, the app where you have to like sign off with your sexual partner about consent, and then it drafts up a legal contract that you can use just in case she accuses you of rape or something. Like, it's not how consent works. So I felt like I needed to make a video explaining what consent is. And really, what I try to do with my content is, I don't know how successful at this I am, but I try not to make it condescending. I try to just explain stuff in the most like clear way because I come from the respect, especially after talking to people, I believe that more people oftentimes just don't have the information. Some people do and don't give a fuck. Um, but most people, I think, just don't know. You know? Um, one thing I realized when I traveled is that you know, a lot of white people apparently only live around other white people. And so they have all these very strange views of racism because they've only heard of black people. They've never met a real black, you know? Um, <laughs> and that blows my mind because I grew up in the suburbs, but very diverse suburbs. Um, and so, you know, traveling and, and stuff, it's, it's really helped me sort of feel more of a, a necessity for my work. I mean, and Trump too, there's also, there's also that. Um, and so right now, that's kind of what, I'm, what I do. Um, I went from sort of having these very personal conversations on my channel to kind of changing my platform to an educational, conversational one. And one of the big reasons why I started doing that was because I started hearing from teachers that they would show my videos in their classrooms, which I never thought that that would be a thing. Um, you know, but the art student in me is like, that's so subversive to like show a black trans woman talking in like the space where she's not supposed to be. It's like so subversive. So like, that's why, <laughs> that's one of the big reasons why I keep doing it. It's just, you know, to be able to be in that space and, you know, teach the, the children's, you know, feed them my feminist propaganda and all that, um, you know, and influence them hopefully in a positive way. And, you know, um, my last talk I did, I had this, this kid walk up to me and say, you know, I saw your video that you did with BuzzFeed um, and it helped me understand that I was trans. Um, and that I always, you know, get so happy hearing that because, you know, when you're doing this, I mean, I'm the sort of person, I just work, you know, I just put my head down, I work. I don't really think that much, I should, I don't really think that much about who's watching, you know, and like how it's really impacting people. So sometimes when you meet those people, it's like, oh, wow, I guess people do watch this stuff, you know? Because um, I just love making videos, you know? Like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a blogger. I like the sound of my own voice, you know? So sometimes I'm just like, I just really like this video, you know? Um, but it's, it's been really great to be able to, you know, create content that changes. And I love social media, and I love new media in general, because I think it's democratized a lot of conversations. It's made it so that we don't have to prove ourselves to the establishment in order to have a conversation that needs to be had. Um, and like I said, when I was a kid, I never saw anyone who looked like me. And I know that that was because of all of the layers that you'd have to go through in order to prove that you were worthy of even being on the television. Now we have a situation where most of us have high definition, high definition cameras in our pockets. You're not spend your you know, Sims expansion pack money on a webcam, it's in your phone, you know? Um, and so I love that and I really, you know, always encourage people to, if you have something you want to say, say it, you know? I never knew how much me just talking about my life would influence people in a positive way. But I get messages from kids, I get messages from parents of trans children that say that my content and my visibility has helped them feel like they can exist in this world. And to me, that, um, that makes it all worth it. All the harassment, all the crap, I'll take it all day long, as long as it helps you know, a couple of kids out there. So that's what I do. <laughs>